So this would also be your explicit uh, agreement consent with the recording. And um, yeah, I'm very, very happy, very, very pleased uh, to have this a dialogue today on the implementation of research integrity and ethics training, a perspective from um, IARMA's Ethics and Research Integrity Officer Network, uh, Arion. <clears throat> Maybe uh, just one sentence about who I am and which institution I represent. My name is Katharina Miller. My background is law, I'm a lawyer, and I've been working with Path to Integrity for the third year now. So during three years, we have been trying to, um, yeah, to promote research integrity within European Union. And you're still on time to participate in our call for papers or here. Uh, I think the deadline is the end of April. And we invite all of you to write articles on how to teach and learn uh, research integrity. So this uh, was it about us, but I'm very, very yeah, proud, I have to say, and happy that we have three amazing speakers uh, today. And I would like to introduce you to them in a row all together, although they will speak one after the other. And I would like to start with uh, Jonas Ackermann, who is a philosopher turned administrator dedicated to pathfinding, road building, and cultivation in the research integrity and ethics landscape. Jonas, uh, you are a research integrity and ethics coordinator at Stockholm University and co-chair of IARMA's Ethics and Research Integrity Officer Network, Arion. You are um, yeah, docent, uh, an associate professor and reader in theoretical philosoph uh, philosophy. Uh, but your current position is at the Office for Research Engagement in Innovation Services, where your responsibilities include a ver variety of things in the research ethics and integrity area, such as support researchers and leadership, developing policy documents, handling of research misconduct, external conducts, and much more. And you are also member and secretary of the Association of Swedish Higher Education Institutions Expert Group on Ethics. A very warm welcome, Jonas, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Our second speaker uh, will be Karim Maumut, um, who has also a very long CV. So uh, Karim, you are an impact facilitator with an interest in responsible research and innovation approaches. I just have to accept a uh, new, yeah, Tom is coming as well, fantastic. Um, you have a very comprehensive career in research management, as, uh, spanning the entire life cycle from proposal development to project implementation and the subsequent management and creation of outcomes. So Karen, you have also worked in the private sector and process improvement, and then developed your career with academic research support, where your interest in inclusive and responsible innovation has been growing. And this has led you to uh, working within a university spin-out company where you provide operational expertise to ensure efficient commercialization. Yeah, in your previous years, uh, roles, you, have, uh, you were responsible for identifying sources of funding, financial management of complex projects, including European funded grants in developing routes to impact as part of research proposals, contract negotiation, business development, and for providing project management during innovation actions. You are also an assessor for IARMA certificate in research management, a member of the Arian community, and, uh, and that I like very, very much, I have to admit, you are a gender equality trainer. Yeah, you have uh, B, um, yeah, BC's uh, Hans in genetics, a biobusiness uh, degree from Aberdeen, and you are prof uh, professional. You have professional qualifications from the ILM and PMI. A very, very well, uh, very warm welcome to you as well, Karen. Thank you very much for joining us. And last but not least, um, our female speaker today. Um, I'm very happy and also very proud to have you with us, Eva Casamitiana Martinez. Uh, you have a degree in biology from the University of Barcelona 
and a PhD in development genetics from the Univers University of Utrecht. You have a postgraduate degree in international cooperation project, project management from the Open University of Catalonia. Yeah, you have also a very <laughs> long and uh, broad, wide experience. Um, for example, you have been developing research as a visiting student at the Development Cell and Molecular Biology Group of Duke University in North Carolina, United States. Um, you were a doctoral student with the thesis receptor uh, kinase signaling in Arap uh, Arapidopsis root meristem maintenance at the University of Utrecht. Um, at the moment, you are working, or since 2016, with the integration of CRISIP to the IC, IC Global, in, yeah, based in Spain. And you joined the Research Coordination and Management Office within the Projects Unit, where your main responsibilities include the career development of pre-doctoral, post-doctoral, and junior PI researchers, development of research policies, management of the scientific committees, scientific coordination with strategic partners and integrity of research and good scientific practices. And since 2016, you have been a representative of IC Global in the Good Scientific Practices Working Group of the Barcelona Biomedical Research Park. Thank you very much also to you, Eva, for joining us. So, dear participants, you see that you have fantastic uh, speakers here today. Let's enjoy the one hour that we have together with them. The planning is that they will speak now for 45 minutes in total, and then we can enter a dialogue with them with questions, uh, suggestions, comments, remarks. Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'll just actually leave the floor to Eva and Karim who will take the first presentation. So please. Thank you. Okay, so I will try. Thank you, um, Catherine, for, for the, the presentation and also for uh, inviting us to present here. It's an honor. So I hope uh, um, this will be a lively discussion and, and open to interruptions if you consider um, also during the talk. So I'll try to share my screen now. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you see the screen? But yes, we can see your screen, but it's black. It we can't see your presentation yet. Okay, one second. Doesn't seem to work. Actually, I cannot do anything at all. Okay, I will anything. give you. I will make you um, co. House, maybe that has an effect. I don't think so. Okay, I think now it's this is working. Yeah. Yes, it is working. We can see your presentation. Okay. But something is happening with my screen here now. Really weird. Can you see it? Uh, it has disappeared. We could see it a second ago. I think it always disappears when you put it in a presentation mo um, mode. Maybe you have to just leave it open. Okay. I think I, I cannot, the, the, um, the mouse doesn't even. We can see yeah. your mouse. So it's moving, the mouse is moving. But it's not. Nothing is happening. I cannot also know. Let's see. No problem at all. An option could be that you sent me the presentation. This could be, could be another option. Yeah, the problem is that uh, anything seems to respond. So I can move the, the mouse, but it's when I click, nothing happens. So I'll try to disconnect and yeah. Yeah. 
Karim, in the main, uh, I, I suppose that you have the same presentation. Do you want to send it to me? Um, my presentation uh, follows on from Ava's part, right. um, but perhaps uh, while we wait for her to log in, it would be nice just to mention br very briefly about IARMA in case uh, people haven't heard about it. So um, IARMA is the European Association of Research Managers and Administrators, and uh, really it brings together a range of different research uh, professionals that are involved in the management, not in the actual um, doing of the research, but in supporting it. And the Orion community is really specific to uh, research integrity and ethics officers, those who are responsible for administering those processes. Um, and Jonas co-chairs that, uh, that particular group. And so um, I think as a, as a organization, it's very nice for um, collaborative networks within Europe, but also bringing a different dimension that national research management bodies um, don't necessarily have. So every country will have its own network of research managers, but uh, having that European level where you discuss pan-European issues, I think is really important. And uh, I was very pleased when the Orion network was established because there was a real gap in supporting um, research integrity professionals with their day-to-day -day job just because of the nature of what it involves. Jonas, do you maybe want to say a couple of things? Well, it was very, very nice presentation and, and introduction to the network. I, think I can only agree that it has been a pleasure and, and, and very beneficial, I think, for uh, at least for me, but I think for many community members to have this this network. To, um, it's, it's, it's a great resource and, and that, of course, depends on the, uh, the people in the network. So if you do work on these issues or, or know someone who does and would like to join and contribute and benefit from this network, please uh, please let us know. It's it's free for everyone to join. Uh, and right now, since everything is online, also the events are, are free and, and uh, so it's easy to join and, and you're very welcome. Thank you. And Eva is back. So Eva, would you like to try again? You're muted. I think you're still muted, Eva. Eva, you're still muted. You're still muted. Okay, now? Now, perfect, um, yes. I'm really sorry, it never happened. Oh, I used Zoom so many sorry. times, but... Don't worry, all good. <laughs> so I'll try again. I, I, I just also send it you um, yeah. the, the presentation in case a weird thing happens again. <laughs> Let me try. We can see your presentation. Okay, I'm not sure if I should try to use the slide mode. <laughs> Let's see. Perfect. Can you still yes, see it? it is working. Oh, yes. Good. Yes. This is a relief. Okay, sorry. Uh, really sorry for that. So, anyway, I'm really glad to be here and share with you. Um, the report uh, we developed from uh, within Orion uh, related to implementation of research integrity and ethics training. So uh, this, I think, uh, um, Jonas already explained what Orion was uh, is right, and uh, took the opportunity to invite you all to join if you haven't done so. So Orion is the um, European Research Integrity Officers Network. Um, from the European Association of Research Managers and, in, and Administrators, and we held uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, we meet a couple of times every year on topics, and we discuss topics that uh, are in, um, or of relevance for all of us. So, I think it's a has been a really uh, interesting network to be part of. So, we really uh, invite you to to join if uh, you are not a member yet. 
So last year, almost a year ago, the 9th of March, um, the same week that we got locked down. And so I think it was the last meeting I had face to face for the last year. Uh, we had this um, um, meeting in Eindhoven and we, the topic was at that time, uh, training in research ethics and integrity. So we organized a session in, in a morning uh, plenary sessions and then in a World Cafe format in the afternoon. I don't know if you are, um, um, if you know the methodology, so you have different groups, different tables with a chair and a rapporteur, and people can switch between tables, between sessions, um, uh, to promote uh, active discussion. So we actually focus on, on two aspects, um, the, the, on, on research ethics and integrity training. So the first session, we discuss best practices for the implementation of such trainings. And here we focus on asking participants to think about uh, case studies, uh, good, um, good practices, um, tools, useful tools uh, when organizing trainings in research ethics and integrity. And uh, the second session was on, on what uh, participants thought were the key elements uh, um, for organizing and implementing research ethics and integrity training. And here we asked the participants to uh, imagine how an ideal um, um, research and ethics integrity training should look like. So the reports of the rapporteurs uh, were then shared with a group that uh, volunteered to prepare a report with the main conclusions. This group was um, um, was uh, composed by uh, Jonas, uh, Karim, uh, Stephanie van der Burg, and, and myself, and we drafted and shared uh, the report with the community to get input. And finally, that's the document that came out. This is an open document. You can find it at the, um, at the web and, and you can share the slides afterwards. So the link is on the, on the, on the um, image. First, I, I, what I wanted to remark is that not surprisingly, uh, the main consensus was that any um, research performing organization should provide um, training in research ethics and integrity. And how this training should be that differ and, and would depend on, on, on issues such as the size of the organization, its capacities, uh, the requirements that it has and the regulation that, um, that uh, apply. And actually all these elements should be considered when designing a, a research ethics and integrity training. And we think that it is important and key to have always a, a training on research ethics and integrity because it facilitates the promotion of uh, compliance. Uh, it, it promotes uh, high quality research and excellence and, and keeps up uh, high standards of ethics and research integrity within the, the, the research organizations. Having said so, uh, we organized the, the report in, in three major themes. First one uh, on topics related to the policy framework, the institutional embedding and the leadership. Then we focus on, on how the training should be adapted to different audiences and then about um, lear learning outcomes and, and delivery. So I will present, uh, the I will focus on the first theme and then Karim will, will um, uh, focus on audience and, and learning out on some delivery. So not surprisingly, what we thought it was a, a precondition for a successful uh, research ethics and integrity implementation program within an institute, in, in an institution, it's leadership support. So to have the senior leadership support within the organization, it's key, uh, not least because they need to allow sufficient resources to develop it and to implement it. And to help to make your case, we think it can be framed um, within, so research ethics and integrity should be framed as a central aspect of high quality research and excellence within the organization. And maybe uh, sometimes it's needed to point to the risk on, of non-compliance or, or of ethical and, and uh, research integrity breaches and what um, that could cause within the organization. And as a signal of the importance of this, uh, of ethics and research integrity for the organization, we think it's important that institutions nominate a, a research ethics and integrity advisor or officer as a main contact point uh, within the organization for these issues. And also as a key person for uh, organizing and delivering um, training on research ethics and integrity. 
And of course, uh, ideally, this should be embedded in an institutional uh, um, environment, uh, promoting and fostering open research uh, in a comfortable uh, learning setting where um, people can learn from mistakes and, and, and there is an open atmosphere for discussion and, and, and learning. Having said that, when orga organizing properly the, the training, uh, what we think it should be initially and, and considered, it's uh, the policy framework in which uh, the, the institution is based. And the starting point should be the for any European institution, of course, the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, which is the document that the European Commission recognizes as the reference for research integrity in Europe. And this will be further strength, strengthen in the Horizon Europe, as you probably know. But not only that, uh, the national regulation, the regional local ones and your institutional codes of conduct, if, if, they, uh, if you have one, should be considered and, and framed within the, the training. Beyond that, there are other policy and other statements that your institution might have endorsed. For example, the statements coming from the Congresses, the World Congresses on, on Research Integrity, and the first ones were the Montreal Statement related to research integrity in cross-boundary collaborations, or the Singapore Statements, where it defines the principles and responsibilities for researchers and research institutions in relation to research integrity, and the more recent one, the Hong Kong Principles uh, for Assessing uh, Researchers. And beyond these ones, there are many others, uh, like the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment and the uh, misuse that uh, many times uh, institution and funders do on using uh, journal metrics for research assessment, or the, the principles of uh, the Leiden Manifesto on how, how to do a, a, a proper uh, research assessment. And there can man, be many others. These are just some examples of international um, statements and declarations that your institution might have endorsed or might have, might be considering of endorsing, but maybe also there are national or regional uh, statements that you, you should be considering as well. Importantly also are the funders' requirements in relation to research ethics and integrity and, and this is uh, actually something that can, can help engage also researchers on, on training and especially maybe uh, PIs in this case. As, um, so our, um, our recommendation here would be to analyze or, and, and to assess the landscape, fund, uh, the, the, funders, um, the landscape of funders that, that your institution have and which requirements in relation to research ethics and integrity uh, they have and that are relevant for the researchers in your institution and that should be considered also when preparing a training. And then there are also other policies and procedures that are more directly or indirectly linked to research ethics and integrity that should be considered when organizing um, such trainings and for example here we talk about open science policies, the GDPR, data management, compliance, clinical trials procedures, ethics committee, but also, for example, some career development policies or activities that your organization is, is doing. Normally, these um, different um, policies or expertise lay within different staff in the organization. And our recommendation here would be to establish a network of colleagues uh, which manage these issues as a forum for um, coordination and exchange of experience and, and, and that can help also um, participate into the uh, trainings, either at faculty or central level and, and, and so on. So now I, I would like to hand it over to, to Karim that will focus on the next two, two themes. And of course, I will be open to questions and, and to discussions and suggestions afterwards or, or now if you prefer. So let me stop sharing. Are there already questions to Eva? By the way, thank you very much, Eva. Very, very interesting. I'm just trying to stop sharing. Just a second. OK. Yeah, perfect. So then maybe the questions for later. Karim, the, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see that 
All right. Perfect. Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, yes, similar to Ava, thank you very much, Katarina, for inviting me. Um, we have seen the three themes uh, that Ava touched on earlier, um, and I would like to focus on audience and learning outcomes and delivery. But before that, I just want to reflect for a moment on the importance of that policy framework and leadership. And the reason is that you need to have something to guide the requirements and you need to have a context in which you're providing the training. And as we'll see later on, this is very, very important. So when we think about audience, we're actually looking at a number of different factors who the training is aimed at, that's what we mean by the audience, but what is their interest in ethics and research integrity? Is it important that they just understand a general overview or do they need to have more in-depth knowledge? And then how engaged are they with this topic? Because um, it might be that they require incentives to take part. And so some nice ideas came out from the workshops around um, certificates or uh, creating badges like reproducibility champion or integrity um, specialists so that it can be seen as part of the personal development uh, for researchers and encourage that active participation. The other aspect was career stages because it was recognized that um, the type of training will vary depending on the career stage of the researcher and also whether it's compulsory or not. So quite often institutions will have a compulsory policy for uh, PhD students, but then for staff, it's optional. And then the other aspect that was quite interesting was the actual role of the person. Is it just limited to uh, purely academic staff or should we also include technicians, project managers, any data manager, management staff involved in the project? and other support staff. So having that clear and unambiguous uh, policy at the beginning will help determine your audience and will also create um, a more positive research culture within the institution. The next two aspects were just around the actual learning outcomes and delivery. Uh, once you've identified your audience, you actually have to carry out that training. And so I want to talk about that for a moment. A number of different issues arose. Are you going to force everyone in the institution to, to undertake that kind of training? Or will you have a policy that says it's compulsory for some people, or perhaps general modules are compulsory and others are optional? Is it all academic staff? Is it just PhD students? And then deciding on what are the topics, um, there was a very long list of topics identified. I've pointed here just a couple of interesting ones. So obviously it was recognized that um, those involved in clinical research and the medical field will have different kind of um, training requirements. If you're working with human participants that, or vulnerable, vulnerable groups, that is also different. Um, and then some interesting topics that maybe um, are quite, uh, controversial perhaps, like authorship. Um, who should be an author on publications? And one point that I really liked was about embedding training in other activities and initiatives. So for example, there is Open Access Week. So during Open Access Week, you can talk about all aspects of data management. It doesn't mean that you don't do that at other times of year, but it, it means that you can have a, an emphasis. Similarly with um, uh, International Women's Day, you can discuss gender equality issues, LGBT History Month, you can talk about diversity and inclusion. So there's a lot of different um, initiatives and activities that institutions already uh, organize and celebrate. And there's, there's a, a way in which you can integrate uh, the training and discussion of research integrity issues within kind of the normal events and normal discussions to, to help increase um, that positive culture within organizations. And so then we come on to the training delivery. Um, and in the workshops, it was broadly agreed that the resources, time and policies and 
national initiatives will dictate how that training is delivered. But nowadays, um, it's really important to focus on that audience from, from the beginning. Um, online is, of course, uh, now I think pretty much the only solution given the coronavirus um, pandemic. But what was really interesting about this is that there are different approaches. So online courses that are just self-paced, um, online delivered webinars, which are more interactive, and pre-recorded videos, et cetera. Workshops and lectures still before the pandemic remained the most um, common ways of delivering these types of training activities. But the feedback suggested that it would be good to make them as fun, as interactive as possible um, to help drive that engagement up because it can be seen as quite a boring topic. Um, so it's nice to increase the engagement through the use of uh, games or some kind of interactive activities too. It was also recognized that actually beyond training, discussion-based activities um, are, are useful. And the other point that came up was that it's not just the person responsible for research integrity within the organization, but they can use the expertise of other staff in the organization, from the data management staff to the legal experts and other academics to help deliver that training. So really in conclusion, all the three themes are linked. Um, that, that was very important. They're very high level. And it's important that the policy is there in order to drive um, the learning outcomes and delivery and the selection of the appropriate audience. I just wanted to kind of finish with a few personal thoughts on this. Um, the whole aim of doing training in research ethics and integrity is to increase uh, that positive culture institutionally and remembering that that culture is multi-layered so it differs within different departments and different parts of the institution but it's also dynamic people often say oh but that's not the culture in our research group and my response is that's okay change it it will take time but you can do something about it um, and then a few other points that i want to just go through very very briefly um, Different institutions have differing levels of resources and prioritize research integrity in a different way. It should be about support and academic staff working together in order to ensure proper research integrity. You can use different tools like integrity promotion plans or integrity audits to actually determine the state of play in your organization. And really ask yourself the question, is integrity embedded or is it just a box ticking exercise? Do you just have a policy because you need to have a policy? Then there's a question around the civic responsibility of universities. So they are the gatekeepers of knowledge. They should ensure that the knowledge is curated properly. Academics themselves have personal choices that they can make in order to ensure that we don't do sloppy science and sloppy research. And training in research integrity should be seen as a lifelong um, endeavor. It's not just at one point in time. And the question I have is, is research integrity a top issue for scientists? And if not, why? This book by Stuart Ritchie was published last year. It's very interesting. Um, if you haven't heard about it, I can recommend it. Um, it exposes fraud, bias, negligence, and hype in science, and discusses a lot of the issues uh, that are very relevant. That's everything for me. Thank you for your attention. I'll pass over to Jonas. Thank you very much, Karim. While Jonas is preparing, uh, yeah, oh, he's already ready. Okay, <laughs> so Jonas, the floor is yours. And you're muted. I don't know if you're if you're speaking, but you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, all, all good now. Good. So this I used to have this one slide and it's intended to just basically summarize some of the uh, things that have already been said, but also to uh, visualize in a way uh, some important aspects uh, of succeeding. Um, 
So, so we have these different starting points that we uh, have heard about now. We have the, this policy embedding, you have codes and regulations, global and local, both at the institution and from the outside, and also external requirements, which are not in the form of perhaps codes or regulations, but uh, requirements for, you know, to receive funding or requirements from collaborators might be contractual obligations. And you have various other stakeholders that might, in various ways, demand things from the organization or from the researchers. Um, and the organizational preconditions, of course, uh, we touch upon that as well. The, the research environment is, is a crucial factor here, uh, but also how the organization is structured and what resources you have to put into the training and to other uh, measures to promote research integrity. Uh, and of course, the audience part here, uh, knowing who needs to learn what and Ideally, everyone at the institution will have some level of uh, knowledge about research ethics and integrity. Uh, even purely administrative staff should know a little bit. I mean, they don't need the same kind of deep and, and um, directly applicable knowledge as the researchers, but the more people who know and are able to discuss these issues and also see what's going on around them with those glasses on, as it were, uh, the stronger the research ethics and integrity culture at the institution will be. So some things that are crucial, uh, we think that networks across organizations uh, that was mentioned as well, and we already talked about area, and that's one example, uh, how we can use networks across organizations, uh, internationally and also at the national level, to uh, discuss uh, these issues, learn from each other's experiences. I think that's hugely important because implementation is uh, difficult to predict in many cases, but if you can identify some things that have worked or hasn't worked in another organization, which is in at least some relevant respects similar to yours, then you can learn from others' mistakes instead of having to do them yourself over again. Uh, also, as Karim mentioned, networks within the organization that you have, of course, uh, some form of dedicated uh, research, research uh, ethics and integrity support function, but also uh, if you have support staff working with data management or legal issues or archiving, uh, then working together with them will enrich both everyone's competence, but also if you can embed this in the training uh, that will be a, uh, a good thing, not just for the training, it will also have a good effect on the organization. Because it will also create links between these support uh, functions, which will help when it comes to something else that I don't think we mentioned this. Now, maybe we did, but we didn't emphasize as much in the previous presentation, but this thing about learning opportunities outside of training. So you have the training program uh, and that's, of course important but then also you will have if you have a living discussion and open research culture you will be able to promote research integrity and ethics uh, in other ways as well uh, and here i think the support functions has a crucial role because each support case will be a, an excellent learning opportunity uh, especially if you have an open research culture where that will lead to more discussion with colleagues because then you'll get a very concrete case where you see, oh, here I ran into trouble and I was able to solve this or I, I, was a, I had to confront this dilemma and, uh, and that will be an experience which will be something that you learn from and also something that can uh, spread in the organization in terms of, of the discussion and uh, willingness to discuss this if you handle this in the right way. So having a good, uh, well-functioning support function, which also makes use, of course, of the other competences within the organization is also crucial for these learning opportunities outside of training. Uh, leadership support was emphasized earlier, and that's of course very crucial. And, and um, it has to do with resources, of course, it has to do with, with the, the research culture, I think, at the university. It's, it's so... Um, and it works both ways. I mean, you need to be able to, to, to sell your solutions to the leadership. And then, of course, it will be easier to sell it within the organization if you have the support of leadership. But then again, it's easier to 
have the support of leadership if you already have support from researchers. So it's, um, it's a complicated, um, usually a research organization is complicated in that sense that you have various levels of uh, stakeholders and interests uh, and they depend on each other in, in different ways. Uh, it's important to realize that it's not, it's not just, the leadership will not just look at policies and external requirements, they will look at a lot more in many cases to what the researchers and, and the staff uh, demands and what they think they need. And, and so you need to convince people in the whole organization. Uh, and it's not always perhaps the best strategy to start with the leadership, but sometimes it is. So that, that will also vary within different organizations. Uh, you will need to have your training adapted to various audiences. You will have to have flexible outcome, uh, learning outcome goals, because again, who needs to learn what? Different people in organization need to know, learn different things. And it's important then to be ambitious, but realistic. I mean, again, the idea is that everyone in the organization knows everything, <laughs> uh, but we'll never reach that goal. We'll not have uh, a situation where everyone in the organization is an expert in research ethics and integrity. And it's important then also that people realize that they are not experts. But what I think is a reasonable minimal level for anyone in a research performing organization is to know the basics, to be able to orient yourself uh, in your everyday uh, work. And crucially, to know when you need expert advice so that they can identify the situations where they need to counter the support function or a colleague or, or uh, so they can see when they need help. I think that's, if, if we reach that level uh, of awareness and knowledge within the organization, it's, uh, uh, we have won a lot. So I think that's maybe what I wanted to say about these points. I hope they can be sort of a springboard into a discussion. I want to mention, I also think that this, this might be useful to um, start the discussion about what we need and uh, expect from projects like that to integrity. Um, and I think one, one general consideration there is to remember all of these differences between organizations, this, this variety of, of needs. Uh, on the one hand, it's of course, what you would like is a ready-made, as an administrator in, in, in the face of implementation, a ready-made tool that you can just use right away and that will work perfectly in the uh, specific uh, situation where you are. But that is of course impossible. You will be able to do that for, for one individual perhaps. So I think that's 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 the challenge. Uh, on the one hand, it's very hard to provide ready-made tools that can be used uh, that are also specific enough to be really guiding. Uh, uh, so I then, of course, you can you can offer more general tools. But I think one one way, and I, I think this is also. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the way that you think about this is that some of these tools, you don't need to adopt them fully. I mean, you, you, can, uh, you can use them as inspiration uh, and uh, take bits and pieces out of the, the, the project outcomes and implement them in your organization. And that is, of course, um, easier if that is encouraged from the side of the project, but also if they are adapted for that. I mean, if, if everything is presented as, as a package uh, where you need to accept the whole package or, or nothing at all, then it will be, be difficult to, to get organizations to implement this. But if you can present it more as a bits and pieces that you can use and, and uh, put together to something that fits your organization, that will be more attractive. And that will also be easier to sell to the leadership, for instance, than to the researchers. So that's just one, uh, one comment on, on that topic. So I'll, I'll stop here and look forward to a fruitful discussion about this. Oh, thank you so much, Jonas, also for this input, uh, which yeah, complemented you, complemented each other uh, perfectly. Thank you so much. And in fact, you um, already raised a question, Jonas, 
um, what uh, yeah, could path integrity uh, do or what what is the place of path integrity within all of your three presentations? And the um, a very good thing is that we have here our coordinator, uh, Professor Julia Pries Buchheit. And Julia, would you like to enter this reflection of Jonas, made by, uh, by Jonas? And so that's how we could start our dialogue. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you first for really interesting uh, presentations. Um, I, I enjoyed to see the different angles and, and uh, different facets which you actually face in, in, in your positions. Um, and I think we could already see how difficult is or how, how many facets are uh, when you look at research integrity and supporting a culture of research integrity. Um, and Jonas, you already raised this really difficult question, what can projects like Path Integrity do uh, and, and actually uh, which output would be, um, uh, would be a good one which can be used. And the last two years uh, really showed that it is difficult um, to, to make the, the perfect output which can be used. Uh, and for me, it is, um, getting more and more interesting um, to see, okay, what do we actually fa face? Do we face a challenge uh, of knowledge in a sense that we still do not know how to engage, how to motivate um, people uh, to support this culture of research integrity, that this was a little bit like, or I could hear this question in your talk, Karim. Yeah, so how can we engage them? How can we motivate them? Um, or is it still a challenge um, of, okay, what is research integrity in a sense of the content? It is so fluid, uh, even in the last two years uh, where I uh, now concentrate, really concentrate on this topic, like there, there are new topics uh, emerging um, and, and it shifts a little bit. So we are all in a field uh, which is not stable in a sense of, okay, this and this and this is research integrity. And as soon as the people know this, then they can say they are, they are high ranking and have a lot of um, um, capacity uh, in, in research integrity. So these are the two challenges I am always facing. On top of it, of course, the question, okay, and what can a project specifically do? But uh, past integrity concentrated a lot on the first one. Um, so, but this is uh, actually, I, I'm going to enter this dialogue with another question, <laughs> with a counter question. Um, but before uh, before we start, Jonas, I, I wanted really to um, highlight one of your topics. And this was the, the opportunities outside of formal learning courses, uh, uh, which, you, um, which you highlighted. And I do think there is a lot of um, opportunities which we, do not fill, um, or which a lot of universities and, and organizations do not fill um, and should fill because there are some opportunities which can raise the culture of, uh, of research. Yeah, Jonas, you're muted. No. So, you, uh, Julia, is this a question to um, the? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, it, it was a comment to actually it's to all. And and so for me, it would be really interesting to have a specific look at this um, outside of formal courses opportunities and probably some examples. Uh, so so how can how can a culture of research integrity be be supported outside of formal courses? Um, because there is still uh, still a lot of um, space, and there is probably yeah there are probably um, opportunities we didn't encounter, uh, which we can use for the future. That's not an easy one, Julia, but maybe <laughs> I don't know spontaneously, Karim, Jonas, Eva. Uh, any, uh, yeah, Karen? Yeah, I think I, I, I briefly mentioned um, in, in the 
presentation, um, the opportunity to use existing initiatives like Open Access Week, like International Women's Day. Um, there are so many, every day there is something happening. Um, and there, there are these calendars that uh, marketing people use that show you, you know, when is Earth Day and when is, uh, you know, a sustainability week, et cetera. So I think there are, if, if your institution is already actively engaged in creating events and activities around um, certain themes, um, then you can also create um, other events or add on other activities that are going to fulfill some, some learning outcomes. And actually, I think most people react better to spontaneous um, kind of events and talks and guest speakers than they do to a training session. If you tell people, oh, this training is available, come if you want, um, that might not necessarily attract a wide audience. And also, of course, I mean, such informal learning opportunities, it won't give you the same control over what people learn. Perhaps you cannot state learning goals that you have to tick off at the end of the course. But uh, again, this but being ambitious and realistic at the same time, uh, I think you should, I mean, this shouldn't be instead of training, of course, it's a compliment. And as Karim says, I think we're likely to reach people in those contexts that you won't reach through the training programs because they won't sign up. Uh, and this includes, uh, as, as I also mentioned, uh, in the administrative staff, for instance. I mean, people who often perhaps don't think that they are concerned by these questions. So we're trying now very to be very, uh, when we're, we just, decided uh, on a research ethics policy at Stockholm University. And now when we're trying to promote it, uh, the way we present it is that this is something that concerns everyone. Although of course, uh, it's primarily directed to, to researchers and, and students doing research like uh, things. Uh, but just to sort of emphasize that, that this is an issue that concerns everyone. Uh, and good ideas and tools for managing that kind of, how should I put it? Well, this, this issue of succeeding and addressing the whole institution in, in a good way. That might also be a thing that projects like Path to Integrity can, can help out with. And if I can add, I, I think uh, this is a really relevant topic. And I think that's uh, what I see as very important is the institutional embedding in the sense of the culture within the institution. So if we can use, for example, uh, seminar sessions within, we are a research institute, we have programs, but at the faculty level, within the groups, so to promote in, in group discussions, uh, learning from mistakes sessions in a more informa informal way, these are something that um, I think needs to be further ex exploited. And, and this is only, only possible if the research calls are within the organization and not, not only within the program, within the group, fosters this kind of discussions. Thank you very much for these answers, which leads me uh, to another uh, uh, question. As I told you at the beginning, I'm a lawyer and so I studied law and research integrity, as, as I can recall from my studies, has never played a role in my, <laughs> in my German universities, never. So uh, with uh, part integrity, we also try to enter uh, humanities or social science, which is very, very difficult. And it's like if two worlds uh, meet each other and it's, I find it very difficult to merge them. Any ideas uh, of how to smoothen this, these difficulties of understanding Um, I might make a small comment because I used to work with uh, the College of Arts and Social Sciences in a university, and this is a problem that I came across um, from, as someone from with a STEM background. Uh, first of all, it was a, a different understanding um, of how research is conducted in the humanities, and I think that all STEM kind of scientists would benefit from 
uh, more, let's say, social science approaches in their research anyway, because uh, there is real value in, in that kind of perspective. But what I would say is that institutions that have different disciplines should consult with their own academic base to decide on the right framework that is available applicable to those disciplines. There is no one size fits all for research integrity and anyone who says that there is um, is going to find it very difficult to, to create a, a general enough policy uh, to, to do that. So I would say it's always best to use the experts already within the organization, discuss it with them and have them provide the input and how they would like to be governed and what standards they are going to adhere to um, because their own disciplines will have codes of conduct and they will have their own um, kind of professional bodies. So there will already be a framework there that can be tapped into. I don't know if that helps at all. Very much indeed. Thank you, Karen. I can, I can add to that. I, mean, yeah. I think it's um, Karim is absolutely right that uh, you should talk to the, the researchers, uh, which goes back to what we talked about in the presentations. Yeah, I mean, you need to learn to know your audience also for these informal uh, learning activities, of course. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about the humanities and the social sciences recently, um, uh, for many social sciences, this is not new, but but uh, uh, especially some uh, some topics in the humanities, there's been a change both in in uh, uh, the study objects and the methods recently. Uh, so using um, tools and and uh, you address questions and uh, you approach groups that make the research more sensitive and um, also makes it uh, uh, fall in the category of research that might need ethical approval uh, because you uh, maybe most mostly because you process sensitive personal data and so on so we see at, at our university that there's an increasing need for support on these issues in the humanities and social sciences uh, i think the change is, is is biggest in the humanities because uh, you have topics which have moved from basically only doing literature studies or working on a linguistic corpus or something. Uh, and now you have PhD students uh, using material from social media or collecting data in, uh, in Georgia or, or something like that, which is puts them in a situation where they all of a sudden need to consider ethical issues that also that their seniors haven't been uh, trained to uh, handle. So it's uh, that's also a challenge to um, uh, educate all the way through the organization uh, and a good we found that actually a good way to the seniors are, are the juniors so a PhD student will come to us and ask well maybe I need an ethical approval for this but my supervisor says I don't and we will go in and give support and in the end it will be a learning experience also for the supervisor because they will learn uh, so that's that's one example of how you can work uh, as Kareem pointed out directly with the researchers and their needs and thereby learn uh, about their uh, yeah, what, what, what they need and, and how we can approach this to, to maximize the impact on these, these informal learning opportunities. Thank you, Jonas, also for this answer. And Tom, I, I saw your hand waving. Yeah. You wanted to say? Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Um, coming back to the differences between social sciences and humanities on the one side and STEM subjects on the other. I think it, we, we, if we work with this distinction, we risk oversimplifying a bit. I, I guess there is a difference arguably between STEM and uh, humanities. And I also think as Jonas just mentioned, this difference is decreasing. With the social sciences, I'm actually not so sure that the difference is that big. I think it very much depends on the field of inquiry and uh, also on the just the approach uh, a, a scholar uses. You certainly have very science-oriented approaches that try to model 
Uh, there are studies on the ideal of, of physics and psychology. You have that in political science, especially in the empirical implication of theoretical models movement. Um, you also have that in rational choice sociology and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think building this opposition is it is useful for some purposes, perhaps, but we should not, I think, uh, suggest that there are two inherently different camps. And that also then, um, I think, points to uh, that, of course, I think Karim is fully correct when he says there is no one size fits all approach, arguably, um, at least not on a relatively, let's say, if you focus on, on concrete research integrity practices, but we can also move upward on the ladder of abstraction, if, so to speak, um, where I think you can find the commonalities. So. And if you really focus on the overall conduct, on the values that science builds on, there you can find the agreement across uh, all, all disciplines. Um, like the, I think we all can agree that honesty, accountability, et cetera, are important. So uh, I think this also then points to, uh, for example, for training delivery or for informal learning opportunities on what do you want to focus? And depending on that, you might uh, have the opportunity to have people from many different disciplines together and engage in a very fruitful dialogue. Um, and as soon as you really focus on the discipline specific day to day practices, this gets more difficult. So I'm just, uh, yeah, points to the fact that it's multifaceted and, and relatively complex. Yeah, Julia, would, would you want, yeah. And compliment. <clears throat> so this is the same experience we I mean we made inside path to Tecrity. So there are um, so we designed courses for interdisciplinary groups uh, and we designed courses for disciplinary groups and, and both have their advantage and disadvantages but the disciplinary groups of course can go much more deeper in a sense of concrete um, challenges uh, whereas the interdisciplinary groups, they can exchange their thoughts. And I do think that this makes sense too, to see, okay, uh, uh, what is the problem in social science and what is the problem in my uh, field and, and how can I profit to listen and, and, and probably even to transfer uh, solutions from one field to the other. Um, there is a study uh, that when we go down now to, to uh, secondary school students, <laughs> which I do not know is not your field, uh, but there are studies that academic integrity increases a lot when, they, when the organizations have a code of honor, which the students know, the secondary school students, in the sense of that they can recite it, that they know, okay, this is our um, ideal of our school. And it is a significant difference uh, from schools with such a code of honor um, to schools which do not have such a code of honor, when you look at uh, how many, oh, how often students plagiarize. So with the code of honor, they plagiarize less. So my question is, okay, if like this is, uh, this is a quite simple and profound fact. Um, does it make sense and we do have we do have our code of conduct, and we actually could say, okay, this is some kind of code of honor in a sense of, okay, my organization have this has this code of conduct, so it is something I, uh, which applies to me, which I have to comply to. Do you think this code of conduct, which we do have in uh, uh, RFO uh, research performing uh, organizations and um, and research funding organizations? Do they, do they have the same effect as these codes of honor? Or do we need something on top of our code of conduct to implement this motivational aspect? And do you think this is a way to go? Yeah, I think it's important to have these codes. Um, I mean, there's also psychological research that shows that having a, I mean, being, being reminded about uh, some ethical code of some time, of some, of some kind, uh, just before being given a certain task, for instance, uh, decreases the risk that you will cheat on that task. So, and it doesn't really, it doesn't even have to be something that you believe. I think if I remember correctly, this is from one of uh, Dan Ariely's studies. Uh, in one of the cases, 
there wasn't even a code of conduct, but they, the experimenters told the subjects that there was uh, and asked them to sort of, well, now think about this code of conduct and, and then, and, and, but this is a very short term effect. So I mean, just being reminded about the code of conduct is, is, is uh, so you need to do it often. So I think in order to, to actually make this, um, have these long term and more deeper effects on, on behavior and, and conduct, uh, we need to think more about also, I mean, I think Tom is perfectly right that we can all agree about these, these principles uh, on a very general level. But one thing that is different between different topics, and the dividing line is not just between STEM and uh, social sciences and humanities. There are a lot of dividing lines within these categories as well. But what you need to find is, is what resonates with uh, people, and that will be different. So for instance, you will find that in certain STEM topics, uh, it's easy to get a discussion going about authorship because they are used to having a lot of authors and they have a practices which uh, are, are perceived as inappropriate by many people, but are well established. So that they have a real situation with that. So that's easy to sort of, uh, that's one good way to start a discussion about ethics and integrity in that field. While for instance, in, in um, some other field where they're not used to having anything else but single authors, so very rarely have, have uh, more than one author, then that might be a, a good a good way into the subject. So again, general principles, yes, but, but uh, finding finding these things that resonate with different different researchers, and that must of course also be reflected in the materials we have and, and the, the resources we, we provide for our, our researchers and, and, and co-workers. Thank you, Jonas. Karim first, Eva, and then you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Katerina. Um, Tom, I really agree with you that the dividing line is much thinner than, than we oversimplify it. I think it's just for, for discussion purposes, um, it's sometimes easier because if you, if you say that there is no difference, then um, <laughs> you get a bit of pushback from everybody. So uh, I, I completely agree, and perhaps I misspoke, but it, it, it's what is most important to me is the role of universities and why we do research and why we do research is to advance human knowledge and create solutions for mankind. And I think if we if we go with that mission, which sometimes is forgotten, um, it's hard to forget, but it, it is forgotten because we, we focus on excellence and publications and impact factors rather than on the role of universities, which is serving their communities and in, you know, advancing human knowledge. So. I think um, there's a number of different um, philosophical elements here. I am not a philosopher, but the, the actual um, behavior of you universities, the behavior of researchers themselves, because they are the ones responsible for actually deciding things. Most often they're consulted, they are on committees, the funders speak to them. It's not them and us. We're all part of we're all part of the, the, the scientific ecosystem. So we can influence certain things. The reason we have impact factors is because at first researchers liked them. Now when it no longer suits us, we are changing our view on it. So it, it over time certain there's been push and pull between publishers funders, universities, researchers, what government want, what people want. And it's, it's, it's tensions that have to be very carefully managed. And sometimes you end up with suboptimal situations like we have now, like the fact that we have career issues for uh, early stage researchers, like the lack of funding, like insecure places in academia, um, predatory journals. So many things have come up thanks to the scientific system evolving in a way which hasn't been carefully managed. It's just been allowed to, over time, grow arms and legs. And I think there is now is a time for countries and to, to look at the international level, perhaps at the international scientific um, community level. Uh, there are different governing bodies, UNESCO, they're working on an open science framework. To, to look at these things and agree, um, how can we set a vision for, for the future of, of research and how can everybody work towards that vision in a coordinated way? I think that that's a very positive thing. Sorry for the very long comment, but I just wanted to mention that. Brilliant, Karim, thank you so much. Eva, to you now. 
Yeah, I wanted to go back to Julia's uh, comment. I think it was relevant regarding the codes. And I think that uh, codes are really important and of course are needed. But for me, what I, I, I perceive as the main challenge is their implementation. And that's why training is critical because I think uh, codes probably most, maybe not, eh, but most organization probably have them now. But the main challenge is to how you implement and how you, so it's not a, I don't know, in many, it's something that you get when you arrive to the, the uh, to the research center or to the university, you sign that you receive them and that you read it and that's it. So the, the for me, the main challenge is how you, you do it to train and to both in a formal and informal way so that the meaning of the code, it's embedded within the organization. So I think that's the great, uh, one of the biggest challenges. But I think, of course, it's important that you have that, but it's, this is only the first step. Thank you very much, Eva, for, yeah, for this comment as well. I'm very time uh, aware. It's already at 12, at 14, and we said we would finish at 12. Are there any more questions in the audience? Jonas, yes, I can see your hand. I can't see more hands uh, yet, Tom. Just a very brief comment about, yeah. um, uh, so we talked a bit about, about conduct. Uh, and of course, conduct is, is, is the focus uh, here. We want people to, to change their conduct. But one thing that's that might be worth considering as well is that we, we want them to change their conduct for the right reasons, right? So that relates to what Karim was talking about. We want them to, uh, well, even if we are like hard core consequentialists in this in this uh, area, that we just care about what what the consequence of this will be, uh, you will have a much more robust change, much much more stable improvement of conduct if people. Uh, change for the right reasons and, and uh, actually do this with the right intentions. And that I think crucially relates to, to Karim's uh, comment about what science is for and what, what the role of the universities are in the more wider context of society. Thank you, Jonas, for this wise yeah, comment uh, that you added. Tom, do you want to have the last word? Uh, well, sure. Uh, yeah, fully, fully agree with what uh, Jonas just said. I think that really um, summarizes things uh, very well. Um, one issue I also very much agree with Karim that we need to ask or keep in mind what research is for and why we do all that. And I think this actually points to difficulty that we might have in teaching at times, because um, I think there is the problem when you teach students about for example, how to write a term paper. The problem is all too often they're extremely ambitious and answer questions that cannot reasonably be answered in a term paper. And the higher, the more uh, people then progress in their career, uh, the less ambitious publications often become because the smallest publishable units are published due to the incentive system. And this kind of then also delineates, I think, a bit where the limits of training are as long as uh, incentive systems are are not appropriate, and this is uh, certainly uh, I think there we can go back to what Jonas said in his presentation: be ambitious in the learning goals, etc. You formulate, but also be aware of uh, well what you can accomplish and what you cannot accomplish. And uh, I think here the incentive system is just something important to consider. And this is uh, something that needs to be reconsidered, I think, as well. So I would say there are at least two pillars to improve the research integrity culture. This is training, focusing on individual, let's say, conduct is certainly one very important thing. But we also need to consider incentive structures and uh, move for improvement from at least two sides. Thank you very much, Tom, for this. If there are not... Uh, not any more questions, comments, suggestions. I would just say that this dialogue is closed for now. However, I would suggest to, to stay in, in contact. Please, everybody who's not a member yet, become a member of uh, Orion. Uh, Jonas was so kind as to publish or to put the link in uh, the chat. I will do so after this dialogue. I will also buy the book, which was recommended by Karim. Thank you very much for this. I would also like to um, 
yeah, yeah. animate you to organize something on the 8th of March, which is the day which was mentioned by Karim, the International Women's Day. You can connect it to science. I think that's a very, very good idea. In fact, we will do so from Path to Integrity. And um, nothing else from my side than to thank very much to our brilliant speakers. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting, very nice to and very important to listen to you, to have this dialogue with you. Um, also, thank you to all the participants for your input. And um, I would say see you soon. We have the record of this uh, dialogue. We will publish it or upload it in our YouTube channel uh, so you can yeah, always come back uh, to it. And nothing else from my side than to wish you a very, very nice day. Stay healthy and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katerina. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.